questions without notice. Are there any questions? The Honourable Member for Tangney. Yeah, Mr yeah. Speaker, I desire to ask a question of the Minister for Housing and Aged Care responsible for the Pharmaceutical Benefits Scheme. And I ask, is it not a fact that on 1 September your office forwarded to ALP member electorate offices a set of talking points to constituents on the pharmacy dispute, which includes the following claims about pharmacists? One, they've got an inflated idea of what they should be paid. Two, they're doing okay. Look at how many there are of them. Three, they were greedy and stupid. Four, they're no better than pilots. Five, they're trying to scare people again. And six, don't believe them. The Honourable Minister. Order. Mr Speaker, uh, the, the point of the matter is simply that uh, what we're dealing with is an issue. Order. What we're Order. What, what we're dealing with here, Mr. Speaker, is an issue that uh, should not have got to this point, and it should not have got to this point because the process for dealing with issues such as this is in front of the PBRT, the Pharmaceutical Benefits Remuneration Tribunal. And in that regard, in that regard, we've gone through a process that has taken this issue uh, of, of a, a proper survey of the cost the and. Re and and uh, providing a, a reasonable fee for the dispensing of items under the pharmaceutical benefit scheme, to a point that, uh, that pharmacists are now not happy with the result. But the reality is that under the opposition uh, parties, when they were in government, when they were in government, they, they, they set up this tribunal to overcome, to overcome the very problems, the very problems that exist now. At that time, we used to, the governments used to sit and haggle with pharmacists over the remuneration. And I think it's important for pharmacists to know, pharmacists to look back a couple of years, to go back a couple of years when, when you were in government and to look, to look at what they were paid then under that system. Under that time, pharmacists under were, were hit with a 40 per cent reduction in real terms. Under this government and under the tribunal, under the tribunal, we have seen now a situation in real terms of 40 per cent increase. Compared to, the, uh, compared, to, compared to the CPI and compared basically to average weekly earnings. Now, I think that's, uh, that's pretty pertinent in the current area. And when we look at pharmacy profits, when we look at pharmacy profits as distinct from pharmacy remuneration as paid by the government for dispensing those medications, we see a situation quite similar. In that regard, and it's quite clear from Pharmacy Guild figures themselves, that uh, they that the, in, that, in that area that uh, pharmacy profits have gone up quite dramatically as well. And, uh, the real, and, and all that the uh, tribunal has done is look at the real cost of dispensing, look at the real cost of dispensing and, uh, and uh, bring down a fee. The now the government order. is prepared. Order. The honourable member for O'Connor on a point the, of order. The standing orders require that the minister be relevant to the question. The question asked him simply, did he send this scandalous document out? And he's giving us a lecture on pharmacy. Order. It's a simple question. Order. The member, the member doesn't have a point of order. The, the minister is in order. The member for O'Connor will resume his seat. Order. Order. The Honourable Minister. Ms. The Leader Mr. of the Speaker. Opposition shall cease interjecting. Mr Speaker. What, what, we're, what we're talking about here is, is, is a relatively simple matter. The government is trying to solve this issue, solve this issue by having negoci negotiations with the Guild. The Guild at the moment doesn't seem to want to negotiate. What the, what the Guild's uh, so-called fallback position at the moment is basically to go and get, uh, over and above the PBRT decision, another $126 million. Now, the government's offer goes back to the point of its offer in May, when it said we would go to the we would want to go to the, tri to the tribunal with a joint submission of $41 million. And the expert panel of pharmacists, which is advising me, is giving me a, has given me quite a very good set of uh, recommendations, which will be taken to the government for decision. And I would hope, I would hope that when pharmacists see the, uh, the, the results of those determinations and the way in which they would be able to be involved in their industry, in the use of it in terms of the development of a, a professional fee and the structure of the industry and, uh, and, in, and in the whole issue of things like essential pharmacy allowance, then we would see uh, much more reason in this. Part of the problem is, 
that the individual pharmacist, I believe, has not been given good information from the Guild over the years. Very few understand the, the reality of, of the PBRT process, nor at this stage do they understand the government's position. And so, uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, at a time when we're, we, we're uh, obviously the, the pharmaceutical benefit scheme is uh, increasing rapidly in cost, and obviously that is not due simply and solely to remuneration from pharmacists, but is driven by other issues as well. I think we have to bear in mind that uh, what many pharmacists are saying to government and what, what many of their representatives are saying to government is the way to solve this issue, the political way to solve what has now become because of the, uh, because of, because of the denial of the PBRT process a political issue, that the way to solve that is to go out to terrorise people, to make them frightened that they won't be able to get their medications, to say that all these pharmacies will close. If they had have been closed, if pharmacies were to close, they would have closed. They would have closed the time when you were in government, cutting back in real terms their remuneration. But they didn't. In fact, the growth in number of pharmacies over the last couple of years clearly shows that that has not been the case. Now, the reality is, Mr. Mr. Speaker, that if pharmacists really want to settle this issue, if they don't want to use, if they say they really care for their uh, patients and their customers, then they won't use them as political pawns. They won't say to them. They won't say to them they, their drugs will be the, will not be there. They will not say to them they'll be charging more. What they should be saying, if they are honest, is that they want their remuneration beefed up. They want their remuneration beefed up by uh, by by the, making the government increase charges to pensions or remove pensioners to other people or to remove medications. We are not going to do that. The government will not make uh, make the uh, customer will not make the patient pay for what just simply pharmacists want over and above what the community expectations in wage areas should be. Well, um, I inform the House that President in the gallery this afternoon we have His Excellency Mr Timakata, President of the Republic of Vanuatu, and Mrs Timakata. His Excellency is a former Minister and Speaker of the uh, Vanuatu Parliament. On behalf of the House, I extend a very warm welcome to our distinguished guest. The Honourable Member for Tangney. I seek leave to table this document from the Minister's Parliament House Office to all electorate staff, is leave which, granted. among other things, says pharmacists leave. are greedy and stupid. Not granted. Uh, the Honourable Member for Brand. Order. Directed to the Minister for Community Services and Health. Has the Minister's attention been drawn to a report regarding extension of fee relief to the private childcare sector and what are the implications of such an extension for childcare? The Honourable Minister. What does Mr Braithwaite say? Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I am aware of a uh, report. Order. The Honourable which... Minister for Social Security will cease interjecting. The Minister for Aboriginal Affairs will cease interjecting as well. And members on my left will cease interjecting. Mr. The Honourable Minister. Mr Speaker, I am aware of a uh, report uh, in the Sydney Morning Herald which uh, points out uh, a proposal for an extension of uh, fee relief uh, to the private sector. I think, interestingly, the Sydney Morning Herald heads that uh, opposition childcare policy mark three. And uh, this proposal is that, uh, and it comes from, of course, the shadow minister for childcare, uh, the honourable member for Dawson, and it pro provides us with a previously unheard of and previously uncosted major element in their childcare policy. That is the extension of fee relief to the private sector. Now, we've got to get the picture clear, if we can, of what's happening on the other side. First of all, we had what we were told was opposition child care policy mark one, revealed by the leader of the opposition two weeks ago, and as the Sydney Morning Herald called that policy irresponsible this morning, and irresponsible it is, because it sacrifices the proper economic management of this country for an irresponsible, ill-targeted bribe which will not produce a single new childcare centre. And in that economic action plan and in that proposal mark one, there was no mention whatsoever of the extension of fee relief to the private sector. No mention whatsoever of the extension of fee relief to the private sector. Indeed, when we got plan mark two, what I call the Connolly childcare policy, which was revealed this week, and which I noticed the Sydney Morning Herald editorial describes as both intelligent and responsible. 
but it contained <laughs> it contained just the opposite. It said fee relief would be cut to stop people getting both fee relief and the rebate. Now, of course, the Leader of the Opposition rebuked the member for Bradfield for disclo disclosing these opposition plans of some uh, 30, 000, uh, uh, inability to go on with the 30,000 new childcare places and to privatise the system. But when he reprimanded the member for Bradfield, he made no mention of this proposal to extend fee relief either. What he said to the journalists, don't listen to the member for Bradfield. The person who's responsible for childcare policy is the honourable member for Dawson. Go and ask him about the childcare policy. And that is, apparently, that is apparently what happened. They went and asked the member for Dawson, and he produced an entirely new promise, one we hadn't heard of before and one which certainly hasn't been costed, and we'll come to the costs of it in a moment. He said, not only will the opposition give the rebate to all and sundry, regardless of need, that is, maintain the bribe, but in addition, it will extend fee relief to commercial childcare centres. Extend fee relief to commercial childcare centres. And then he said, it won't cost any more because everyone eligible for fee relief has already got a place in the public sector. Already got a place in the public sector. And therefore we didn't. Therefore we didn't have to cost it, he said. Now, anyone who knows anything at all about childcare, anyone in this country, knows that despite all our efforts, there remains, and we've admitted it, there remains a significant unmet need amongst middle income and low income families. There is no way, there is no way that extension of fee relief to the private sector would not have significant costs. And of course, the Honourable Member for Bradford, the Honourable Member for Bradfield interrupts because he was making this point very clear himself. Because he was saying, <laughs> we, are going to, we are going to drive middle income people out of the public centres because so many people need these services. So it is balderdash, balderdash to suggest that this extension will not involve a very significant additional cost. And the Leader of the Opposition now has to answer some questions. Which is the opposition's childcare policy? Is it the irresponsible bribe? Order. Is it, <coughs> Order. Is it, is it the bribe he announced two weeks ago? Or is it Mark II, that is the member for Bradfield, certainly more logical and coherent version? Or is it Mark III, the even more irresponsible and even more expensive plan announced last night by the member for Dawson. Because if the shadow member for Dawson is right, therefore the shadow treasurer and the leader are wrong in their sums. How many extra hundreds of millions will it cost to extend a fee relief system to the private sector? Or is, of course, the leader of the opposition going to say, as he said to the member for Bradfield, that the member for Dawson has got it wrong? He simply made it all up, like the member for Bradfield. Now, people will expect from this opposition is the Leader of the Opposition and his Shadow Treasurer right, and therefore their figuring right? Or is Mr Dawson, is the member for Dawson right? <laughs> and because he will destroy your figuring altogether. Because yesterday my colleague the Treasurer said that uh, you were simply adding a brick to his Empire State Building. With the proposal from the member for Dawson, you've knocked the brick off, you've begun to cut down the surplus. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Menzies. Uh, Mr Speaker, my question is directed to the Minister for Administrative Services. The Minister will have seen evidence given in the Independent Commission Against Corruption concerning his former senior private secretary, Mr Michael Ross, showing that when he started work for the Minister and for the four and a half years of his employment, he was a shareholder in, was actively involved in and was paid money by a property development and consultancy company called Consultants Corporation. With that background information, I ask the Minister, did Mr Ross, before he started work, make the declaration of interest required by the Prime Minister of all ministerial staff, and did the Minister insist on this being updated every six months, as his own department requires? Did Mr Ross declare his interest in Consultants Corporation? If he did, can the Minister explain how he came to employ and keep a staff member with such an obvious conflict of interest? And finally, if he did not disclose his interest, what steps did the minister take to verify Mr Ross's declaration of interest? 
The Honourable Minister for Administrative Services. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I, I replied to uh, these matters in some detail in the answer to question 2075, which of course appears in today's answer. If I could just reiterate and, uh, some of those points and perhaps pick up your point on the way through, I requested an examination by the Departmental Fraud Control Unit of Mr Ross's actions since joining the department, uh, and this was instigated immediately and he was allocated to different work at the time that I first became aware that he was giving evidence before the ICAC. <coughs> Following the appearance of a second witness before the Commission on the 7th of September, I request, requested through the Minister responsible that the Australian Federal Police investigate the activities uh, of this individual and at the same time he was moved to another area in my department. I then, order. Order. I, if, if the leader of the opposition order. will contain, order. if, the if of the you will contain, will cease interjecting. if this is the minister, if this order. individual order. Officer, the leader of the opposition, the minister, will, the minister won't respond to the interjections, and the leader of the opposition if will the, cease interjecting. <laughs> the member for Ryan will cease interjecting as well. I have every intention of telling the truth, as I did in the detailed answers that I gave to question number 2075. At this point, I then also wrote, because other matters were raised by the, sec by the second witness, I wrote to the Minister for Immigration and Local Government and Ethnic Affairs, and I requested that he investigate references made on the 3rd of October to several immigration matters. I now come to the two points that you raised, the member for Menzies. When uh, Ross was first employed, all the security, the police character, and the pecuniary interest checks were satisfactory, and that was reported to me. And of course, that, that included, at the time, the, uh, the usual ASIO investigations and checks. <coughs> Order. The pecuniary interest that he provided at the time, and which you questioned me about, was in order, and he, of course, did not, he did not declare any pecuniary interest of this nature with regard to interests in this consultancy or indeed any other consultancy. <coughs> those, those, pecuniary, those pecuniary interest forms, of course, were regularly updated <coughs> and a copy of such a form was located and handed over or, or drawn to the attention of the Federal Police, uh, which was submitted by Mr Ross at a time not long before he resigned late in 1987 from my employment. Now, I have undertaken every reasonable action on these matters to ensure that this matter is thoroughly and expeditiously investigated. And I don't feel that I am able to comment beyond this point in view of the investigations and the inquiry which are underway and what may and may, of course, include uh, or may not include but I'm informed by the Federal Police that this may be possible, criminal charges. Now, <clears throat> if I could just conclude, I certainly resent any implication in the question or by the Leader of the Opposition or by any member opposite that I've acted in any way improperly or that I have not taken the required action since I first heard of this matter. <clears throat> and I can only reassure the House once again that all through the time that this individual was employed by me, that I had no understanding or knowledge whatsoever of any such actions that he were mentioned before the Commission uh, were being undertaken by this person. The pecuniary interest firms, forms were in order and all of the relevant checks when he first undertook employment were undertaken. The Honourable Member for Fisher. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer and uh, follows on the answer just given by the Minister for uh, Community Services and Health. By now the Treasurer's attention would have been drawn to reports suggesting that fee relief for childcare could be extended to the private sector. What are the implications of such a move for the government's fiscal policy? The Honourable Treasurer. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, my colleague uh, has 
already uh, art, uh, work, articulated well the, uh, the implications in relation to fiscal policy of such a commitment. And what is uh, surprising about such a commitment is just two weeks after the opposition have detailed their policy in relation to childcare that a plank, which is not part of the policy and uncosted, but which would have very large costs to the budget and the fiscal policy, are now being committed on behalf of the opposition by the relevant shadow minister, the member for Dawson, uh, who is so nominated as being the relevant shadow minister by the leader of the opposition uh, two days ago. Now, Mr Speaker, the fact of the matter is the opposition has been saying there is a need to get the weight off monetary policy and on to the other instruments of policy. But as I have said in the House yesterday and I repeat today, fiscal policy would be weaker under the opposition, the surplus would be 700 million lower than it is now under their policies, and with the policy articulated by the member for Dawson, it would be substantially more than $700 million lower. So the opposition will now have a substantially weaker fiscal policy than the government, and if fiscal policy is weaker, therefore the weight has to go on the other two policy instruments, and they are monetary policy and wages policy. And if wages policy is about enterprise bargaining, and in, a, in times of growth and particularly strong demand, Member for O'Connor, then the strength of that demand will mean that in a position of enterprise bargaining, wage, aggregate wage levels would rise. So not only would the weight not go onto wages, there would be even more weight onto monetary policy. And that is exactly what the opposition basically intends as their sole one-dimensional policy instrument, monetary policy that they would, as they have shown here today, the joy boys of Australian <laughs> politics, whenever there is a problem, make a bigger promise. Make a bigger promise. Don't even stick to the discipline which you imposed upon yourself as, as lately as two weeks ago. Make a bigger promise and then leave the weight on interest rates so we watch, would watch under you interest rates move to their high 20s as you crush the economy into a recession. And I noticed today what the Financial Review has had to say about you, had to say about you in relation to the capital gains tax. And this is the, the final paragraph. They Order. say by putting it on the agenda, the opposition has created a political issue by proposing a weak and philosophically unconvincing proposition. Its policy no, it's the Financial Review editorial. <laughs> it's, uh, its policy response, instead of showing some fiscal spine some fiscal spine lacks any philosophic coherence and will harm revenue. And the same could well be said of this proposition, which is again a bit of policy making on the run, and it just goes to serve the point. As my colleague said, what is your policy on childcare? Is it the original policy you had, where, uh, where you said that you would uh, provide a $20 rebate and uh, keep the fee relief? Or is it the second policy, the one outlined by the member for Bradfield, where there'd be no extra places and fee relief would be diminished by the $20 rebate? Or is it the Leader of the Opposition's announced policy that the places would be built, the extra 30,000 places, fee relief maintained and an extra $20 rebate? Or is it the fourth approach by the member for Dawson, where we'd have fee relief, fee relief plus the 30,000 places and, on top of that, fee relief in private childcare as well. Which Member policy is it? Which policy is it? Which policy is it? What is your policy on childcare? What is your policy? Because we know you're going to. Well, ours is operating. You don't have to ask ours. Ours is actually operating. It's in their private economy. The We've got an extra 30,000 places, and we give we give mothers of low and middle income families 60 to 80 dollars a week fee relief. You wish to give them 20. You will destroy fee relief. You'll take it away. You'll take away fee relief. That's what you'll do. You'll take away fee relief. You won't build government childcare centres. You'll, you'll give childcare totally to the private sector, as Mr Connolly said, to the private sector. And instead of getting $80 a week, those mothers will get $20 a week. And they can't even get 20 because you can't even afford to fund that. It'll be $11.70. 
as we said, it's $11.70. If you take the $800 million error from your figures, you can afford to give $11.70. And so you don't even have a policy. Here we are two weeks after the event and you have no policy other than to promise more money whenever you're put under pressure. And you're the crowd who are trying to convince the rest of us you'd have the spine to run a decent fiscal policy. The Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, Mr Speaker, my question is directed uh, to the Treasurer, and I refer him uh, to remarks uh, just in his just concluded, uh, his just concluded answer when he referred to uh, remarks dealing with bigger and bigger promises. And I remind him that in January of this year, the um, Prime Minister during the West Australian state elections predicted that interest rates would fall by the end of the year. <laughs> Given the disastrous balance of payments deficit, and the downgrading of our credit rating by Standard and Poor's, does the Treasurer still stand by the Prime Minister's projection that home loan mortgage rates will fall below 15 per cent by the end of the year? The Honourable the Treasurer. Uh, Order. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Order. Speaker, this is the first question I've been asked by the Leader of the Opposition. He doesn't normally but ask the me member questions for because continues to he doesn't like the deal with him. He doesn't ask me questions because he doesn't like my answers. He used to. He, he died death by a thousand cuts when he was a shadow treasurer. Every time he had to turn up in a debate with me, he'd have the nervous twitches. He'd be sitting there with the cold, ashen face, hoping to get out of there as quick as he possibly could. And now he hears the day. In the first two weeks that, that uh, the parliament was back. The, the, the member for O'Connor on a point of order. Yes, section 145 and relevance. The question that the Australian people want to know is, are interest rates coming down as the Prime Minister promised? The, there's no point of order. The Honourable the Leader of the House. Speaker, I take a point of order and it goes order. to the question of frivolous uh, interjection via point of order in this place. The first point of order interjected by the member for O'Connor on the previous questioner was uh, against a, a minister manifestly answering the question. The Treasurer had just begun. That point of order was unquestionably a question of, uh, that was a point of policy and a policy dispute. It had nothing to do with the materials being considered by the, uh, by the Treasurer or by a question of order in relation to the orderliness of the answer. So that is quite clearly a frivolous point of order. And I'd ask you to uh, rule, uh, Mr. Deputy Spe Mr Speaker, as to whether or not uh, frivolous points of order are going to be permitted or considered disorderly. <laughs> or, Mr. Dep Mr. On Speaker, a further point of order. On the same point of order, Mr. Speaker. The member for Hume. The, the point of order taken was on the basis of relevance. The Treasurer was, has not been relevant in answering the question. And the, and the point of order, order. Was, the, the point of order was not frivolous, Mr. Speaker. It's time that ministers answered questions and remained relevant. Order. As, as members on the, both my right and left know, we have had out here on frequent occasions the question of relevance. The previous speaker suggested to members that they could find all sorts of rulings in the standing orders and in the practices and precedents of the House to put many different uh, complexions on relevance. Mrs Child also pointed out to the House that you may wish to take it up with the procedure committee and get that committee to make a, a ruling on relevance. At present, the honourable member for Morton mightn't be here to hear the rest of this if he continues in that vein. At present, I find the minister in order. I have drawn the honourable member of, for O'Connor's attention to the fact that he has interjected a number of times and he should cease to do so. The minister will answer the question. Mr. Speaker, in the first Order. Week the Parliament was back, I had no question on economic policy from the Shadow Treasurer, and today, with the balance of payments release, I've had no question either. The first question comes from the Leader of the Opposition, who then tries to refer to the balance of payments number as a disastrous number. In fact, it was a number consistent with the government's forecast for the current account deficit. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, you basically fell on your faces. You thought you'd be in there with a number which was going to uh, Order. Where, you could be, where, you could, where you could beat a big stick. The fact is, the fact is, the, the leader of the opposition will the cease interjecting across the table. Well, that's only a substitute for knowledge. Uh, all these interjections. The now, treasurer Mr. might not respond Mr. to Speaker, the Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the foreign exchange market uh, lifted the value of the Australian dollar after immediately after the. Uh, 
current account number was released. And what it shows is that, of course, the government's economic policy is working. We had a very large fall, a substantial fall in uh, imports, a large fall in imports, a rise in exports. Order. And, uh, and um, over the course of the year, we found that manufactured exports in the September quarter were more than 20 per cent above year earlier levels. So manufacturing is exporting. There's 20 per cent level of growth above manufactured exports of a year ago. And uh, exports of manufactured goods in the non-classified categories reached a peak of 375 million, while strong growth in machinery exports continued with both categories recording historically high levels. So in other words, Mr Speaker, what's happening is that we are seeing still a large re-equipment of the economy. We are seeing heavy, heavy, well, we are, we are importing the backlog of 20 years of sloth under you, 20 years of sloth. And uh, that's why the machinery and plant and Order. equipment the machinery and Order. plant and equipment. Uh, the uh, machinery and plant and equipment imports are coming into the uh, Order. The member for Mayo to speak the Treasurer might wait until the House comes to order. The Honourable the Treasurer. <coughs> The current account is absolutely uh, laced with, ma with machinery and equipment imports and computers, uh, commercial tra transport. Well, Mr Speaker, would you get any protection order. At all from, from these people? Members, members on my left, order. Members on my left have asked questions. The Treasurer is answering the question. The members on my left and on my right should listen to the answer. Now, if members continue to interject, I will deal with them. The Honourable the Treasurer. Mr Speaker, and the result is that we are seeing not simply the accommodation of the largest re-equipment phase in the post-war years, but we are doing it now with uh, watching this month imports uh, decline and the numbers for the quarter being consistent with the government's current account forecast for, for the current account deficit over the course of the year. Uh, as I said at a press conference earlier today, that uh, the key point for Australia is that the government has reignited the torch of Australian investment, and that without investment, order, 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 order. I know, Mr. Speaker, it must. Members on my left will come to order. Order. The House will come to order. <laughs> Donable Treasurer. Mr Speaker, it must, be, it must be a matter of gall for members opposite to believe that the business of the community of this country is voting with its checkbooks in underwriting the largest investment phase in our history when it wouldn't so vote under a coalition government over the last 20 years, that they stayed at home and left their money at home. and That's why we had this enormous structural weakness in the current account deficit of 6 per cent of GDP by 1980, despite the fact we had a commodities uh, boom and uh, a mineral boom and a coal boom, that by 1980 the current account deficit was already 6 per cent of GDP because there had been no investment in Australia in the rest of the economy for 15 years is, as is borne out eloquently in the components of GDP chart published in the budget by the Treasury. Now, the fact of the matter is, uh, Mr Speaker, that we are re-equipping the economy, and despite the re-equipment, the current account will be coming in at forecast. But on the question, uh, and that's why we have had no question today about the current account deficit. Uh, Mr Speaker, on the question of interest rates, interest rates will decline when, Order. when demand conditions in the economy permit. But one thing, one thing will not be happening. We will be not using monetary policy as it would be used by a coalition government to burn the face of uh, Australian industry, to burn activity out of the economy, to lower wages and to lower inflation. We will be not be going for a Thatcher Mark I monetarist policy, which will see, which would need to see resort to interest rates of 25 to 30 per cent to do the job. Now, 
That's the, that's the prospect under the Coalition's Economic Action Plan. The highest, the highest interest rates in our history came from Treasurer Howard. The highest interest rates ever would come from a Coalition government with the present policy in relation to fiscal policy and wages policy. So, Mr Speaker, I'll conclude on this point. Order. Today's current account simply proves once more that Australia is re-equipping itself, that the business community is still rebuilding the capital stock so disastrously run down under our predecessors over two decades, and that despite that, uh, we are seeing the current Ryan. account performing very much in line with the government's forecast. The Honourable Member for Herbert. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I direct my question to the Minister for Social Security. Does the minister agree with the claim that the indexation of family payments seriously reduces the government's ability to control inflation? What commitment has the government made to the indexation of family assistance? And what support exists for this commitment? Point of order, the honourable member for Farrah. I draw your attention to Standing Order 144A, where secondly occurring, which says questions should not ask ministers for an expression of opinion. The first part of the member for Herbert's question was clearly, does the minister agree and previous speakers have ruled that that constitutes asking for an opinion? I, and you will also see that the, uh, the chair can ask the minister to respond to the other parts of the, of the uh, question which asked him about government policy. And I, I'm, I'd have to have a closer look at the first part and have a read of what the, minister, the member for Herbert said, but I'm finding the question in order. <coughs> <coughs> yeah. I uh, thank uh, the honourable member for Herbert for his uh, question. Of course, it goes uh, to an issue that uh, is one of uh, undoubtedly of some sensitivity as far as the opposition is concerned. That is the question of indexation, because the uh, perhaps greatest single uh, deficiency in terms of family assistance uh, in this country has been the lack of indexation of the various payments and rebates. Uh, that are made available uh, to uh, Australian families. This, of course, was clearly demonstrated during the period of the Fraser government, based on the advice of John Stone and Dr Hewson, that the government gave families minuscule leftovers at the end of the budget process. Not one single family payment during that period of time was indexed. Arising from the work of the Social Security Review, this government has delivered fundamental and fair reforms to family assistance measures. In the April economic statement, our reforms culminated in substantial increases in family allowance rates, new benchmarks of adequacy for payments for low-income families, the indexation for the first time ever of family payments, particularly family allowance. That indexation, of course, will lead to further increases in family payments in January. On the tax side of the equation, the government also increased the dependent spouse rebate and sole parent rebates and will index these every year in accordance with increases in the Consumer Price Index. The Australian Institute of Family Studies, commenting on these changes, uh, said, and I quote, the decision of the government to annually adjust all family-related payments in accordance with movements in the Consumer Price Index is the most significant long-term reform of the tax package. I repeat, of the tax package. This is because it will prevent the erosion of the real value of benefits such as payments for pension and beneficiary families, family allowance, the dependent spouse rebate, the sole parent rebate, which are important contributors to falling family incomes, particularly in the latter years of the 1970s. Now, I make this point because yesterday the honourable uh, member for Wentworth uh, interjected to simply make the point. Uh, he said, uh, what more do you want uh, in addition to bracket creep. What more do you want? Now, of course, uh, what that betrays is that the Honourable Member for Bradfield, uh, the Honourable Member for Wentworth, has no understanding of the process of family reform, no understanding whatever. And that when he talks about the child rebates wiped out by the Fraser government and some uh, reintroduction of a rebate, the fact that uh, he fails to understand the importance of indexation simply means that he's not on the path of any significant reform. It's all very well to come into this parliament and quote figures, to talk about what may or what may not be possible, to talk about aggregates, 
uh, hoping that you'll never be subject to any uh, detailed analysis. But the fact of the matter is that any significant reform in terms of income transfers to families, nothing is more important than the question of indexation. And I think the most significant uh, aspect of the economic uh, uh, statement that the opposition has produced is the fact that it neglects, that it avoids that issue and therefore opens the way, opens the way in the event of, uh, of, uh, of a coalition uh, government, in the event of a coalition government, it opens the way, in fact, to dismantle uh, the whole system of family allowance payments and particularly the direct transfer to families, to the carers and, above all else, to the indexation of those payments. You will hear nothing but silence on the opposition when it comes right down to this question Order. of indexation of family payments. The member for Bradfield. To stop interjecting, the uh, member for Wentworth. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. I refer the Treasurer to his statements that, st that the Standard and Poor's rating agency, compared with Moody's, was a more professional body and more credible. Why then does he now claim that their methodology for rating debt is flawed? When will the Treasurer stop shooting such authoritative messages and uh, messengers as Standard and Poor's? And heed their advice that his policies are not working. Yeah, yeah. The Honourable the Treasurer. Uh, Mr. Speaker, their professionalism is uh, obvious. That is, the first thing is that the first we heard, uh, public heard of uh, Standard of Poor's uh, uh, a change of rating in Australia was today. Whereas with Moody's, people heard of it for eight weeks. Over a period of eight weeks, as Moody's leaked bits and pieces of information about their intentions, uh, Moody's behaved most unprofessionally and, uh, and having made an incorrect judgment, Standard and Poor's were left with little, really little option but to follow them down. Order! 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 Mr. The member for Ryan. Mr. And uh, need I say, when I say, Mr. Speaker, the market's judgment about it was that the exchange rate went up. Uh, so the market, which rates Australia every day, just overlooked it because there was no new information in it. But the fact of the matter is that the Commonwealth has no net overseas debt. The Commonwealth has no net overseas debt. And uh, what we've got here, what we had by Moody's, is not Moody's rating the Commonwealth's debt because the Commonwealth could wipe out its overseas currency debt with less than one year's budget surplus. What, uh, I'm just referring to Moody's first. What they did was to say that they were rating the Commonwealth's debt, but the Commonwealth had no net debt and has no net debt, and for its overseas debt outstanding, it could be wiped out with one year's budget surplus. And that remains the position. In fact, if, you, if we try and, if, when I've commissioned the Treasury to try and recover debt, the premium we'd have to pay to return the debt to Australia, to get the debt back, doesn't worth, make it worth taking. We have to wait until it expires because, because the market puts such a high premium on Australian securities. In fact, we're now at a position where I've had discussions with the Australian banks about how we will run the prime asset ratios without Treasury bonds, that the Commonwealth is not only removing its overseas debt but also its total debt. And now the debate is how can you run the banking system without Treasury bonds? Now, in this cl climate, Moody's then downgrades Australia on the basis that there's some risk that our sovereign debt wouldn't be repaid. I mean, it was a demonstrable nonsense. Uh, and uh, Standard and Poor's have decided, because they believe Moody's are rating Australia rather than Australian sovereign debt, that they had no recourse but to do what, uh, what Moody's have done. But let me just quote one, 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 one paragraph from the Wall Street Journal of August this year. Um, this is from their, Order. from their editorial. Order. From their editorial. But it says it all. This is when, this is when the Moody's oh, issue. Order. Members on my left will cease interjecting. This is when the, the House Mo will come to this order. This is when the Moody's issue. Uh, when the, well, this is when the Moody's issue was running. The basic problem is not partisan politics, but the bond agency's fundamental conceit that they are smarter than the marketplace. If Standard and Poor's and Moody's really knew which bonds were better than others, they would logically keep the information themselves and make a fortune trading. But in fact, no bunch of analysts can concoct ratings 
that will outperform, let alone guide, the diversified decisions of the market. Dead right. The honourable member for Robertson. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, on a, on a somewhat lighter note, I would like to ask the acting prime minister a question without very much notice. Um, is he aware of the significance of this day, October the 25th, in the history of this great parliament? In some sense of humility, yes. Uh, <laughs> Twenty years ago to this day, a number of us were elected to this parliament. Uh, some were elected before that date. Most have been elected after that date. Those that were, are still with us is the, Mr McKellar uh, and certainly Mr Cohen, Mr Keating and uh, Mr. Dr Klugman and myself. I think we're the only... Uh, I'm sorry. I, I, th I meant to say there was some continuity of membership. <laughs> he is persistent, yes, he is persistent. I just think it was an honour for all of us, and all, indeed anybody that's elected this place is, is an honour to be here. Uh, <laughs> if, well, uh, if, the, uh, if the member for Menzies continues to interject, I might give him a half holiday. <laughs> I was going to make the point, Mr Speaker, we in government think they're on holidays all the time. But, uh, uh, I want to say how much we appreciate the ability to represent the Australian people. Could I make this point, uh, not in a light-hearted vein, but when I first uh, was asked to come to this place by the constituents of Kingston Smith, which I'm eternally grateful, I had to go and see our whip. I was in opposition at the time on the basis he might allocate me a shared room. And when he said to me who I was having as my roommate, I suggested there was some incompatibility <laughs> and could he make a better offer. He then said, well, I'm being opposed for whip. Will you vote for me? <laughs> <laughs> and I've got a lot stronger since, but I said yes. <laughs> uh, I must say he won by one vote. <laughs> and I want you to know that the roommate that I drew was the treasurer. <laughs> Now, he's gone on to greater heights, and I think it's a remarkable thing to think that those that came to this parliament in that period have made some contribution. Could I say, from the point of view of the Labor Party, if you look at it, in the period since uh, the 20 years we've been here, we've had government for nine and a half years. And that's not a bad record for us, considering in the total of Federation of 89 years, we've only held the title for 24. But in view of the influx of the talent that's come in since 69 on the government side, I envisage that we'll certainly have 24 out the next 24. Thank you very much. Yes. The Deputy Prime Minister asked a question to be placed on that. We have had that. The member for Wentworth. I move that so much of the standing and session orders be suspended as would prevent the member for Wentworth moving forth with the following motion. That this House calls Order. on the Treasurer, in view of the announcement today of a near, another near record current account deficit and a further downgrading Order. of Australia's credit standing by standard. The, que the question is that... <coughs> Order. 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 The, the gag can't be moved till the motion second. Mem the member for Farrah will resume his seat. The Honourable Member for Wentworth. That this House calls on the Treasurer, in view of the announcement today of another near record current account deficit and a further downgrading of Australia's credit standing by Standard and Poor's, to give a detailed and complete account of one, the revised budget forecast for the current account deficit, two, how Australia can continue to run a current account deficit of 5 to 6 per cent of GDP each year. Three, how Australia can sustain a continued increase in our net external debt service burden, both as a percentage of GDP and exports. Four, how debt will be stabilised by the mid-1990s, even on optimistic assumptions. Five, what proportion of the increase in the cumulative current account deficit over the last 12 months can be genuinely accounted for by imports of machinery and equipment, and what proportion of those capital imports will actually flow into the traded goods sector to generate additional exports or reduced imports? Six, what would happen to the current account external debt, interest rates and our exchange rate if A, the terms of trade falls by 5%, B, 
the growth in OECD falls by 1 to 2 per cent from current forecasts, and C, there is a secondary correction in the world stock markets due to further pressure on world debt markets. Seven, the reasons why the move of the public sector into surplus has not had a corresponding impact on the current account deficit as he claimed it would under his twin deficits policy. Eight, the reason why the J-curve model was also abandoned. Nine, why unit labour costs in Australia are growing roughly twice as fast as other OECD countries and the impact that will have on exports and imports. Ten, the extent of the cost disadvantages suffered by Australian exporters due to inefficiencies on the waterfront in coastal shipping, transport and communications industries. Eleven, whether he will accept the judgment and warning of Standard and Poor's rating agency, Order. his preferred agency, Order. having ignored. Order. The honourable member for Wentworth will resume his seat. The member for Sydney on a point of order. Uh, point of order, Mr. Speaker. I was wondering if there's any finite limitation on the length of uh, motions uh, before the, <laughs> that can be brought before the House. There, there is no point of order. The honourable member for Wentworth. I'll start again at point 11. <laughs> whether he will accept the judgment and warning of Standard and Poor's rating agency his preferred agency, having ignored the assessment and warnings of Moody's, and 12, finally, precisely which policies he intends to pursue to get exports to grow by 3 to 4 per cent faster than imports for the next several years, which, according to EPAC, is the minimum required to stabilise our foreign debt to GDP ratio. Order. The question is that the member be no longer heard. All those of that opinion, please say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
lock the doors. The question is that the member for Wentworth be no longer heard. The eyes will move to the right of the chair, the nose to the left. I point the honourable members for Streeton and McMillan tell us for the eyes. The honourable members for Wannan and Riverina Darling tell us for the nose. Order. The result of the division is eyes 74, noes 51. The division is resolved in the affirmative. Is the motion seconded? Most, I the second the motion because Menzies, time the, the Treasurer the came the clean about the, the appalling economic order. situation in this country. The question is that the honourable member be no longer heard. All those of that opinion please say aye. Those against no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute.
lock the doors. The question is that the member for Menzies be no longer heard. The eyes will move to the right of the chair, the nose to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Streeton and Macmillan tell us for the eyes, and the honourable members for Wannan and Riverina Darling tell us for the nose. <laughs> Order. The result of the division is eyes 74, nose 51. The division is resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that standing orders be suspended. The Honourable the Leader of the House. The motion the question is that the question be now put. All those of that opinion, please say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. The division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is that the question be now put. The eyes will move to the right of the chair, the nose to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Streeton and Macmillan tell us for the eyes, and the honourable members for Wannan and Riverina Darling tell us for the nose.
Order. The result of the division is ayes 74, noes 51. The division is resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that the question be now put. All those. The, sorry, that the, the that the that the motion be agreed to, which is that standing orders be suspended. All those of that opinion, please say aye. Those against, no. I think the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. For one minute. I'll give you a special. Order. Lock the doors. The question is that the question be now put, that standing orders be now suspended. The eyes will move to the right of the chair. The nose to the left. I appoint the honourable members for McMillan and Street and Tellers for the nose. The honourable members for Riverina Darling and Wannan Tellers for the eyes. The honourable member for Wannan might. The member for Wannan.
Right, the result of the division is ayes 53, noes 74. The division is resolved in the negative. We have papers. The Leader of the House. Papers are tabled as listed on the schedule circulated to honourable members earlier today. Details of the papers will be recorded in the Hansard votes and proceedings. The